Okay, well, thanks a lot. Thanks again to the organizers <laughs> for inviting me. Um, so this is going to be the second part of uh, this little lecture series. Um, if you don't remember anything of what we did yesterday, um, don't worry. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to assume that you were actually here. So I will try to sort of start from scratch and quickly review what we did yesterday, at least a little bit of, of, of what we need today. Okay, so I will now get to the infinite dimensional Teichmüller spaces, which are in the title of these lectures. So very brief recap. So one thing we did last yesterday uh, was, was to talk about the Verasoro algebra. Uh, so I explained the Verasoro Lie algebra is a central extension of the Lie algebra of vector fields, um, whose dual at level one is the space of Hill operators. Right, so if it's a central extension by R, then the dual space has a map to R. And so you can look at the various level sets, and the level set at level one is the space of Hill operators. And each of these level sets is invariant under the action of diffeomorphisms, and that basically defines what the central extension is. But rather than using abstract terms, you can also just write it out in formulas. So if you introduce coordinates, so your circle is just S1 then the central extension is defined by a co-cycle, this gerfan fuchs co-cycle, given by this formula with a third derivative. The Hill operators, they're just Schrödinger operators on the circle. The potential in this context is then called the Hill potential. And what makes this Verasoro is really the way this transforms on the diffeomorphisms. So if you have an orientation preserving diffeomorphism, so the subscript plus always means orientation preserving me. Then the way it acts on hill potentials is by this formula. So this indicates that we are somewhat dealing with uh, quadratic differentials. So there's the derivative squared. And then there's this uh, affine term, which is given by the Schwarzian derivative. So if you just write down the formula like, like that, uh, well, it's a welcome exercise to check that this really defines an action. Not, not, not that easy. So in, in some sense, I, I think writing the formula is maybe not really the right way to look at it as far as I'm concerned, but it's a matter of taste. Okay, so that's one thing we did. Um, I also told, me, I told you about uh, what, what was our inspiration. Uh, so we are inspired by some physics papers uh, which involve these uh, Riemann surfaces with wiggly boundary. So, so they, they're considering Riemann surfaces um, that, are, um, that have a, um, um, so that, that have a um, hyperbolic metric, but of infinite volume. But to make it then uh, a finite volume, they cut off the boundary with this uh, wiggly boundary. And then um, they're considering some integrals over that. So, so this is directly taken from one of those physics papers. So it's these kind of pictures that served as our inspiration and motivation. And so what we want to say, our claim is that, um, that there's some infinite dimensional Teichmüller space in the picture. Uh, the space of all hyperbolic structures on sigma, where we don't cut off anything, up to diffeomorphisms uh, which are trivial along the boundary. So on this space, one still has an action of diffeomorphisms of the boundary, or to be precise, it's uh, the universal cover of uh, diffeomorphisms of the boundary. And we're claiming that this is actually a Hamiltonian Verasoro space, which means that there is some map to the space of Hill operators that I uh, had on the previous slide. And there's also symplectic two form, which makes it a Hamiltonian space in the sense of symplectic geometry. So those are the things that I want to explain today and tomorrow. Okay, so first of all, I should explain what I actually mean by hyperbolic structure. So our model in this case is the Poincaré disk. So this is our model for hyperbolic geometry. Just a Poincaré disk with a standard hyperbolic metric. Uh, we denote by 
G is group of isometries, orientation preserving isometries, so subscript plus. And I do know by K, uh, the stabilizer of any point in the Poincare disk, um, for convenience, we just choose the center. So that's going to be isomorphic to U1. So a bit more in, in terms of formulas. Okay, so Poincare disk has this Poincare metric, dz, dz bar, divided by one minus d squared. When I write dz, dz bar, this is not as a two form, of course, this is a quadratic differential. So it's kind of the symmetric product. The group uh, of isometries is the group PSU11, and it acts by uh, Möbius transformations. So you could basically take this as a definition, more or less, of PSU11. So you look at the action of um, two by two matrices acting by uh, Möbius transformations, and you ask yourself which of those uh, transformations preserve the Poincare disk, and that's the group PSU11. Right, and then we have this K, uh, which is the stabilizer of the center, and well, the action of G on the Poincare disk is transitive, with uh, K the stabilizer, so it's a homogeneous space, G mod K. All right, so this is the disk model of hyperbolic geometry. Often we actually prefer the uh, upper half plane model of hyperbolic geometry, um, because the metric looks a little bit simpler than so it's just given by dx squared plus dy squared over y squared. Um, in this per perspective, the group G is the group PSL2R, and the stabilizer is the group PSO2. So this means SO2 mod plus or minus one. Of course, that's also SO2. Mm -hmm. it's, it's rotations. Okay, so that's our model space for hyperbolic geometry. And then I can tell you what is a hyperbolic structure on a surface, but let's first do it in the case that the boundary is empty. So first, no boundary, it's a closed surface. So we have a compact oriented surface without boundary. And then I define a hyperbolic structure to be simply given by an atlas. The charts of that atlas take values in the Poincare disk and transition functions are these um, elements of G isometries of the Poincare disk. So if I use the half plane model, it would be elements of PSL to R. That's why they use as transition functions. The tr transition functions are constant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I denote by hype sigma, hip sigma, the space of all hyperbolic structures. Definition clear? Okay. So one thing to notice, uh, hyperbolic structure is actually equivalent to prescribing a hyperbolic metric on the surface. So it's a metric with Gauss curvature equals negative one. In, in one direction, that's uh, obvious, because if you have this atlas with charts taking values in the Poincare disk, well, you just pull back the metric from the Poincare disk, and the transition functions are isometry, so they're patched together. So you get the metric of Gauss curvature negative one. The converse is not entirely obvious, but it's true. And uh, we'll probably actually get back to it later. Okay, so that's how we do it when uh, there's no boundary. Now the question is, uh, what do we do if there is a boundary? How do we adjust this definition if our surface has a boundary? Well, then, we, then I have a manifold with boundary, so my charts took, should take values in the model space with boundary, and the natural model space is obviously the closed Poincaré disk. So that's what we do, very simple. So now we have a surface with boundary and I define hyperbolic structure just as before. It's given by an atlas, the charts, but now the charts are for manifold with boundary and they take values in this closed Poincare disk. And when I say it's, it's charts, I, I mean, really the boundary should go to the boundary. It's, it's morphisms of manifolds with boundary. But otherwise, everything stays the same. Transition maps are given by elements of G. And yeah, that, that's all there is to say. And then uh, look at the space of all hyperbolic structures on such a surface. 
So what about the metric? Well, this time uh, what happens is that a hyperbolic structure is actually equivalent to giving a hyperbolic zero metric on the surface. Uh, what is a zero metric? Okay, so very quickly as an aside, if you have any manifold with boundary, then a zero metric on that manifold with boundary is a metric in the usual sense on the zero tangent bundle. Now I have to say, what is the zero tangent bundle? Okay, the zero tangent bundle is the vector bundle whose sections are the vector fields which vanish along the boundary. No, no. So, so uh, yeah, I was going to say Michael Francis uh, yesterday um, introduced the B tangent bundle. They are the sections where the vector fields that are tangent to the boundary. Now we are requiring that they vanish along the boundary. Mm -hmm. And yeah, maybe I should quickly explain what it means in coordinates. So in this talk, we're mostly dealing with surfaces. And I often use coordinates, x and y, which are adapted. So x is coordinates in the boundary direction, y is in the normal direction. And in this case, the zero tangent bundle is spanned by uh, y d by dx, y d by dy. So this is a local frame. Whereas the b tangent bundle would be spanned by d by dx and y d by dy. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so again, zero metric is a metric on the zero tangent bundle. Equivalently, it's, you can say it's, it's a metric on the interior of the surface, which when you approach the boundary, goes like one over y squared. So it was shown by, by uh, Matteo that uh, if the manifold is compact, then these zero metrics, they're always complete. And for that reason, they're also called conformally compact metrics. So he's, he mostly studied them in the higher dimensional case, but surface case also has been studied, especially uh, one good reference where these zero metrics on surface are, are considered is a book by David Borthwick. Okay, so some examples. Well, the very first example, of course, is the closed Poincaré disk itself. Right. So that, that's a hyperbolic structure, just the, the identity as, as a chart. So you can see that the metric goes like one over y squared. Uh, we should introduce y as a boundary defining function. So for example, you could take y equals one minus r. If you make that change of variables, y equals one minus r, then you see it goes like one over y squared. Hmm. Or even simpler example is to close up a half plane. There you see directly that it goes like one over y squared. Uh, some more complicated example, not really complicated, is the hyperbolic cylinder, the double trumpet in the physics terminology. So for the double trumpet, we need to fix some length. So, so the length of this neck of the trumpet, that's L. And yeah u is the coordinate in, in the horizontal direction and this formula describes a hyperbolic metric hmm. yeah so, so if i um, compactify so i include plus or minus infinity then this is really a surface of boundary and becomes a hyperbolic zero metric i should make a change of coordinates again for example for the right boundary i could use uh, y equals e to the negative r uh, so y equals e to the negative u Mm -hmm. Make a coordinate change, then you see it goes like one over y squared again. Okay, and then you can get more examples um, by gluing together well hyperbolic uh, pairs of pants and uh, and these trumpets. Um, so here one needs to know that um, so that's one basic fact in hyperbolic geometry that if you have a pair of pants. I think most of you have a pair of pants, but here you have a pair of pants. 
and you prescribe uh, three lengths to those boundaries. There exists up to uh, diffeomorphism, a unique hyperbolic metric with those uh, boundaries as geodesics and prescribed lengths. Mm -hmm. So you can take those kind of pairs of pants and put several of them together so long as the uh, lengths match. And then you can also glue in trumpets. And so you get lots of examples in this way. Note that when you glue together the pairs of pants all over the trumpets, you can also rotate. So those are typically different examples. So I, I'll get back to that. Okay. Now, when uh, doing calculations with um, these hyperbolic metrics, the co-frame formalism is very convenient. And yeah, I, I must say, um, before I started working on this, this project, I had learned this co-frame formalism long ago as a physicist. And as a mathematician, I sort of forgot about it and forgot how useful it is. It's really nice. So it's the Cartan co-frame formalism, which we use here for a surface with boundary. So let's say we have a surface boundary and we have a zero metric. Then um, the definition of the co-frame is, well, it's a co-frame for the metric, uh, which, well, one, one way of saying is if you have a metric, if you have a zero metric, it's a metric on the zero tangent bundle. So you can look at local orthonormal frames for the tangent bundle and dually you get uh, co-frames for the cotangent bundle. Right here, I have to add one more thing. So if you uh, take the zero tangent bundle and you dualize it, so that's the zero cotangent bundle, the dual of the zero tangent bundle, that would be spanned by the things that are dual to this. So it would be one over y dx and one over y dy. So things go like one over y. Right, so it's, it's, it's these kind of uh, forms that we are encountering. So, so they have singularities at the boundary like one over y. So oriented orthonormal co-frame. Um, so another way of putting it is just that the metric can be written as alpha one squared plus alpha two squared. And the fact that it's oriented means that the volume form for the orientation should be alpha one wedge alpha two. Okay, and the way this co-frame formalism goes is um, that you define the so-called spin connection. So if you, so that's the thing, if, uh, that's why you pass to the co-frame, to co-vector fields, because they're one form, so you can take the exterior differential. And d alpha one is going to be some multiple of alpha one wedge alpha two, d alpha two is going to be some multiple, and therefore you can find a unique one form satisfying these equations, right? You just write your, your one form kappa as a function times alpha one plus a function times alpha two, and those two functions you can determine from these equations. So this one form is called the spin connection. I'm not exactly sure why, maybe somebody can enlighten me later. Okay, so there's this uh, third one form in the picture, and the beautiful fact is that if you take now the differential of that new one form, it's the Gauss curvature times the volume form. It's a really nice fact. So you can take this if you want as the definition of Gauss curvature. In my opinion, it's much simpler than the definition of Gauss curvature than, that you learn in typical curves and surfaces courses. Really easy and really easy to calculate. So, so let's summarize again. So we have these three structure equations. D alpha one, uh, D alpha two, that's basically the definition of the uh, spin connection. And then there's the third structure equation, which you can say is the definition of the Gauss curvature. So it's a really convenient way of, of actually calculating the Gauss curvature in concrete examples. Yeah, so let's consider some examples. For instance, the upper half plane. Um, basically, when I write the metric like this, the co-frame stares you in the face. It's some, some nice choice. 
right? You just take dx over y and dy over y. You do this little calculation, you calculate the spin connection, it's minus dx over y. And then you do the calculation of d of kappa, and you find it's minus alpha 1 wedge alpha 2, therefore Gauss curvature is negative 1. You can almost do it in your head. Or probably you can do it in your head. So th this example may be slightly more tricky, right? Again, uh, the way it's written, you can basically see what the uh, nice choice of cool frame is. You calculate the spin connection. It's basically the cosh gets replaced with a cinch. Then you take D of this kappa and, and, and you check that it's minus alpha one wedge alpha two. Therefore, Gauss curvature is negative one. Right? Without the formalism, it would be much harder to check that actually it is true that the Gauss curvature is negative one. So it's, it's really, really easy, very convenient. Okay, so yeah, more exercises. So here, here's another uh, very useful fact. Um, let's consider you know, just a special case of hyperbolic matrix where the Gauss curvature actually is negative one. So the Gauss, uh, the Cartan structure equations simplify the last term Gauss curvature has, is negative one. Well, in this case, the Gau uh, structure equation is actually equivalent to having a flat connection. So you just arrange these one forms in some uh, two by two matrix. Think of this as a connection one form. And then these three equations are equivalent to that connection one form being flat, to, to, to it being Marocatan form. No, not a difficult exercise as you can imagine. You just check. Just do the calculation. It's a, you saw all these, it's a good point. All these considerations at this point are local. That's, that's a bit of a disadvantage. So, so we've been choosing local co-frames. We, we, in general, we cannot do this globally. The, the co-frame is not uniquely determined. It's, it's only determined up to some rotation. And yeah, the next exercise is about that. So what, what happens if you do a rotation? That's interesting too, and another exercise. So suppose you rotate your co-frame. So point by point, you rotate by some um, rotation matrix. R of theta by some angle theta. So you get a function with values in SO2. Then this connection changes by the gauge transformation. And the perhaps interesting thing is the, the gauge transformation is given by uh, R of theta over two, which is half the angle. So this, um, Someone tells you that uh, if you try to geometrically interpret this uh, connection, it's definitely not a connection on the tangent bundle. It's more like a connection on the like square root of the tangent bundle. Yeah, again, a pretty straightforward calculation. So if you would uh, want to do things globally, then you have to keep track of some co-frame rotations and, and patch things together. Okay, let's uh, do some examples of these um, connections. So if you do this, for example, for the uh, close upper half plane, maybe I should have written down again our standard choice of uh, co-frame, then you get this connection one form. It's upper triangular. Or if, uh, yeah, so there, there's some generalization for it. I mean, maybe as, an, as another exercise, you can figure out what it is for this cylinder, but, um, yeah, interesting fact, uh, you can modify this example and put a function t of x down here with some y squared. You, you see that this is again a flat connection. You can check. And so it determines a hyperbolic metric. You can go the other way. Well, I have to be a little bit careful. There's some tricky issue here. Maybe go back. So if I have a flat connection, you can ask yourself, can I go back? Well, if I have the connection one form, then I can uh, use this formula to define alpha one and alpha two and kappa. Um, and then I can use this to define the metric. The only problem is alpha one and alpha two, they really have to be a co-frame. They have to be linearly independent. And that's, that's a condition. 
So that's not automatic. You have to sort of impose it by hand. It's some sort of positivity condition. So up to that, you can use then flat connections to define hyperbolic matrix. And yeah, so there, there's some, some condition here, some, some region where this defines a hyperbolic matrix, but it's actually good. Okay, so to summarize this section, um, hyperbolic matrix can be described by flat connections, at least locally. And the flat connection is um, uniquely defined up to these co-frame mutations, some, some gauge transformations. Yeah, and so, so some re remark I'm making here, is, uh, you can use this fact uh, to give pretty simple geometric proof of the fact that hyperbolic structures are in one-to-one -one correspondence with hyperbolic zero matrix. Um, I think maybe I, I, I kind of like this, so maybe I, I explain briefly how this goes. So you write down your connection one form. How did it go? Um, I can see we have the... That, that's one of the same convention, right? Mm -hmm. So we have this, this uh, connection one form, and it's flat. So this means locally, uh, it's of the form G inverse DG. I can use parallel transport. Now we know um, that we can always make co-frame rotations by, uh, by K, right, by, by rotations. So, so K being this SO2 inside G. Mm -hmm. So we can always make co-frame rotations. And using co-frame rotations, well, I can write my G as KAN using KAN decomposition. So that means some rotation times something upper triangular. This would be upper triangular. So using uh, K, I can actually change things to make this go away so that G becomes upper triangular. After the co-frame rotation, then, so, so if G is upper triangular, then the A will be upper triangular, which means that uh, G upper triangular means that uh, alpha one plus K equals zero. So alpha one is equal to negative k. And then you look at the structure equations. So this was uh, alpha one wedge k, or minus that, I forget. So it's, it's then zero. So alpha two is closed. So you can write alpha two as dy over y. And you're kind of in, in business, right? So. And, and then you also check y times alpha one is closed from the structure equations. So that can also be written as dx, and you have introduced your coordinates. So it's a really simple proof. I mean, th this was in the case without boundary. In the case with boundary, so for the zero matrix, you have to be a bit more careful to, to see what happens along the boundary, but it's the same idea. Okay, so just, just showing again how useful this Cartan formalism is. Any questions? Okay, so then I should go to those Teichmüller spaces. So now we're considering a compact oriented surface, possibly with a boundary. And our definition of Teichmüller space, I already gave it before formula, uh, uh, informally, is um, the space of all hyperbolic structures up to diffeomorphisms, which are trivial along the boundary. And the subscript uh, zero or O it means the identity component. So it's diffeomorphisms which are trivial along the boundary and which are isotopic to the identity. Mm -hmm. So if you divide out by all orientation preserving diffeomorphisms, 
which are trivial along the boundary, then you get the Riemann moduli space. So it's a further quotient. The way those two are related, are related is the moduli space is the quotient of the Teichmuller space by the mapping class group. So there's still some options of um, well, making some, some twists and, and so on, right? So some different morphisms that are not isotopic to the identity. Okay, so yeah, well known that if the boundary is empty, then those are finite dimensional manifolds. Uh, well, in the case of um, the moduli space, there are some orbital singularities. Never mind. So it's the, the, the fine dimensional and smooth. If the boundary is uh, non empty, then they're always infinite dimensional, of course, right? Because we still have the different morphisms of the boundary in the picture. Okay, so yeah, how, how, well, what is known about Teichmuller space uh, in the case without boundary, of course, an awful lot. I mean, this, this handbook of Teichmuller theory has how many volumes by now? It's thousands of pages, so infinite amount of information. But but some of the very basics is um, that one has these Fenchel Nielsen coordinates on Teichmuller space. So the Fenchel Nielsen coordinates are defined uh, using a pan's decomposition. Again, I will explain this very briefly. I'm just I'm not familiar with this. So I already explained about uh, the pairs of pants. Uh, so if you prescribe those three lengths, there's a unique hyperbolic metric on them up to diffeomorphism. Uh, one more thing one uh, knows is, so, so here, here the boundaries are geodesics. There are unique geodesics connecting these boundaries and which are orthogonal to the boundary. So for each pair of boundary components, there's a unique, what they call seam. Seams, three seams, they're geodesics. And now when you glue together several pairs of pens, um, well, you could align the seams, but you don't have to, right? You could just, just rotate and you could even twist. So the way you uh, fetch news, so in, in this picture, I've, I've twisted them a little bit. Mm -hmm. So the way Fenchel Nielsen coordinates are defined is um, given a surface, you basically have to uh, prescribe what are the, I would call the model seams. Then there's some configuration where the seams all align nicely. And from that kind of rest configuration, everything else is obtained by twisting. So th those are the coordinates. Uh, so the Li are the length parameters the length of such a pan's decomposition. Well, maybe I should have said that too. So pan's decomposition, of course, means that you're writing your surface as a union of such pairs of pans, something like this. So, so the length of these uh, geodesics will uh, be some of the parameters, and then these twist parameters. That's how it goes. Okay, and what about symplectic structure? Uh, well, in the early days, people didn't really think about the symplectic structure. They thought about the Riemannian structure and the complex structure. And then it was discovered that they are compatible. So, the Teichmuller space in finite dimensions has a canonical Kähler structure. And it was, was kind of difficult and tricky theorem back then. And uh, probably still is. Uh, then in 81, Volpert suddenly discovered that uh, in Fenchel Nielsen coordinates, uh, the, the symplectic structure is actually as simple as can be. It's, it's just given, in, in, the Fenchel Nielsen coordinates are double coordinates. Couldn't possibly be any simpler. I mean, the factor of one half is just convention. So that's one perspective. There's another perspective which uh, came a bit later, uh, independently by Goldman and Hitchin in, in 87, uh, which says that Teichmuller space can also be regarded as a connected component of the representation variety for the group G uh, 
in PSL2R. Yeah, so he, here one has to explain um, the representation variety if the group G is, so if the group G is um, simply connected, then the representation variety is connected. But if G is not simply connected, then it has several connected components which are indexed by the fundamental group. In this case, the fundamental group is integers. Ah, so sorry, I'm not, not saying this quite right. The topological types of, of bundles are classified by the integers. Not all integers contribute to this representation variety. There is this famous uh, Milner-Wood inequality, which says that uh, those bundles, so, so again, okay. so, so the bundles are classified by integers, topological types of bundles, and those bundles which emit flat connections are exactly those in the range 2 minus 2g up to 2g minus 2. So plus and minus the Euler characteristic. So this, this interval, every integer emits a flat connection. And those are then the components of this space. And the extreme components of that space is Teichmüller space. So that's what they discovered. But not, not only that, uh, this space has a well-known symplectic structure. And uh, yeah, the canonical symplectic structure on Teichmüller space is the same one up to normalization, of course. Okay, so that's for the finite dimensional case. So, so now if the surface has boundary, then as I said, the type of space is infinite dimensional. So what can we say? Well, if the space, uh, if the surface is the Poincaré disk, the closed Poincaré disk, then what we, uh, obtaining is diffeomorphisms of the boundary up to uh, the action of G. So it's, it's, it's actually quite simple. You look at uh, the standard metric on the closed Poincaré disk, then you act on it by diffeomorphisms. You get other examples. But then we're only looking up to diffeomorphisms which are trivial along the boundary. So that's basically why the diffeomorphisms of the boundary remain. And G, of course, acts by um, isometry, so it doesn't change anything. That's why it's this homogeneous space. So th this is sometimes co called universal Teichmüller space, or some completion of this is called universal Teichmüller space. It's also a particular coagent orbit of the Verazoro group. Um, I can explain that a, a little bit. So if, if you remember from yesterday, the quotient orbits of the Verazor group are basically given in this picture. Right? Parabolic, hyperbolic, and so on. And the one, uh, the, the quotient orbit that corresponds to this space is exactly this one. So if this is zero, it's kind of one, the center element one. Okay, yeah, if you um, take the cylinder, it's basically the same story. You start out with the standard metric on the cylinder, you act on it by diffeomorphisms. But then modulo diffeomorphisms, uh, which are trivial along the boundary. So that basically boils down to uh, taking both the boundary components and moving them around and extending to the interior. If you move both boundary components in the same direction, because nothing happens, it's an isometry. That's why we divide up by R. Yeah, and in the higher genus case, um, you again have some sort of Finch and Nielsen coordinates. So deep inside the surface, it's the same story as before. You're gluing together pairs of pants with some twists. And then you need to keep track of what happens to the trumpet ends. There's a length parameter, kind of the neck of the trumpet and then you twist the boundary around. So that's, that's what it is as a space. Any questions about this? Yeah. 
Yes, yes, yes. Aren't there some subtleties about how the smooth structure of the sort of um, boundary of a hyperbolic surface and the smooth structure on the interior sort of interact? Or like I don't think there are any subtleties here, but, but it's, uh, I mean, always talking about morphisms of manifolds with boundary. So if I say diffeomorphism, first of all, uh, it would mean that it, it would extend if I just. I think I should ask you that. Uh, if, if it just complete the manifold a little bit and get rid of the boundary. But then it should be amorphous of manifolds with boundary, which technically means that boundary defining functions pull back to boundary defining functions. Yeah. Hmm? Oh, the diff zero, um, the subscript zero means always homotopic to the identity. Subscript plus means orientation preserving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, to emphasize again, this, this tilde means universal cover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so one gets this picture for, for Teichmuller space when, when one, uh, and, and I should maybe also say that the space, uh, it's clear from this description, it carries an action of the universal cover of diffeomorphisms. If I go instead to the moduli space, then uh, the diffeomorphisms of the circle act directly. I don't have to go to the universal cover. So rotating the boundary all the way around is, is, doesn't do anything if, if I'm in the moduli space, but in the space, space, it's, it's, it's a different metric. Any other questions? Yeah, then uh, I want to explain the moment map. Uh, I haven't explained the symplectic structure yet, but still I want to first explain uh, what the moment map is. Because if there's some moment map, then uh, by definition, it should be an equivariant map into this space verse star one, which is the space of Hill operators of the boundary. And I should be able to say actually what it is. Yeah, I can, I can say it, and it's actually pretty simple. And the quickest definition, um, the quickest description uses the identification of Hill operators with projective structures, which sort of was, was in, in the talk yesterday, but, but I didn't stress it very much. So let, let, let's um, discuss that a little bit. So what, what is this projective structure? I can define projective structure similar to how I de defined hyperbolic structure. So projective structure on an oriented one manifold is given by an atlas with charts. The charts taking values in RP1. And the transition function should be uh, like local projective transformation. So it should be in PSL2R, because PSL2R acts on RP1. That's a projective structure. Yeah, and so I'm claiming uh, the space of Hill operators is isomorphic to the space of projective structures. And the proof is actually, no, I basically explained it yesterday, but not, not very clearly probably. So if you have a Hill operator, then you can look at pairs of local solutions. By ODE theory, they don't vanish simultaneously, so I can look at the ratio as a map to RP1. And those are my local projective charts. So, so the fact is, it, it goes both ways. So if I have these charts, I can write them in the form u1 dot dot u2. And if I have these local solutions, I can reconstruct what the Hill operator was. So it's, it's the same, same space. In some sense, uh, projective structures are easier than Hill operators. But, um, for us, it's important that the space is actually an affine space. So if you think in terms of projective structure, it seems maybe a little bit strange why, why it should be an affine space. But for the space of Hill operators, that's obvious. So both of these descriptions have um, advantages and disadvantages. Okay, so to explain what the MOM app is, I, I can explain it quite simply in terms of projective structures. 
So I identify RP1 with the boundary of the Poincaré disk. And then I'm claiming a hyperbolic structure on the surface gives rise to a projective structure on the boundary. Well, this is really almost not a proposition. It's, it's really an observation. Um, can, can somebody tell? <laughs> Why? Why? Mm -hmm. Well, the way I, I would put it is uh, we have these shards which take values in the closed Poincaré disk. You just restrict them to the boundary. Then it takes the boundary to the boundary of the Poincaré disk. That's all. It's, 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 it's totally obvious. <laughs> hmm? Okay, but uh, you might be somewhat dissatisfied with this description uh, of the mode map. Well, the, the mode map, uh, yeah, should have said uh, it, it descends from hyperbolic structures and to Teichmuller space because it certainly doesn't change if you um, modify it by different modes which fix the boundary. So this is some description of, of the mode map, but it's sort of indirect. So if you think of the Teichmuller space as some equivalence class of metrics, and you think of uh, hill operators really as hill operators, you kind of want to have a formula. But you can calculate it. So we, yeah, again, we, uh, using coordinates x, y as, as above, uh, we kind of want to write down what the hill operator actually is. And well, in some sense, it's, it's an exercise to work it out. And we did that exercise. And this is the answer. It's, it's somewhat pretty. So, so the way it works, I'm not sure if I can do the pointer here. Oh, yeah. The way it works is um, we write our metric in local coordinates x, y. Then we have the volume form, which is going to go like 1 over y squared. And here we pick up this function a of x. That's one ingredient. So we look at the most singular part of the volume function. The other thing we do is we look at uh, GGC curvature of these straight lines, the, the horizontal lines and local coordinates. So if um, our space is the upper half plane and you look at the lines y equals constant, the GGC curvature equal to, equal to plus one. All of the GGC curvature equal to one. And one can show that in general, if you have any hyperbolic metric, the GGC curvature of these straight lines always has this form. So it's, it's, I mean, it depends on x, y. So it's a function of x and y. And if I look at the Taylor expansion in, in, in y, it has this form. It starts with y squared. And here I'm picking up another coefficient c of x. And using those two ingredients, I can write down a formula for the Hill potential very explicitly. So that's what the calculation gives. We can make it even more explicit if you want. Uh, so given uh, a co-frame for the metric, we can look at the coefficients and we can directly write down a formula in terms of the coefficients for the co-frame. So it's all very explicit. Symplectic structure, I think I'm almost out of time. So um, I think uh, symplectic structure will probably have to wait mostly until tomorrow. But I can um, at least give some, uh, I, I can already tell you one answer in terms of Fenchel Nielsen coordinates. So at the end of the day, there will also be a description in terms of Fenchel Nielsen coordinates. And here's what it is. So if I write my Teichmuller space in this form that I mentioned earlier, so there's these components from inner um, circles that we glue together, and then there are component, uh, some, some parts coming from the trumpets. It's given by this uh, very explicit formula. So there's some term which is like in Volpert's formula for the inner ones, just the same. And then there's some term which corresponds to the trumpet ends. So each trumpet makes some contribution to the symplectic form. And that symplectic form for the trumpet is given very explicitly by this formula. Okay. So using this in, in principle, one can already check if you want that this actually defines a Hamiltonian Vera Zorro space with some effort. 
but of course it's it's very dependent on the choice of Fenchel Nielsen coordinates. So even um, for a surface without boundary, you would never take Walpott's formula as a definition of the symplectic structure because it depends on the choice of pan decomposition. It's not obvious that if you choose another pan decomposition, you get the same expression. And so we wouldn't want to use this as a definition. So, so I, I want to give some definition tomorrow, which does not depend on any such choices. No, no, I haven't defined it yet. Uh, I want to get there tomorrow. So that's the plan for tomorrow. I think I'm, I'm done, yeah.